from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And here's what's ahead. K-State's Sarah Lancaster will join us to talk about pre-emergent weed control for new corn stands and why she believes that the pre-emergence treatments are an important complement to post-emergent control. She'll go over the proven herbicide combinations for this purpose. Then from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCohen has very fresh information on the new Paycheck Protection Loan Program created in the wake of COVID-19. He looks at what's known to this moment about farmer eligibility for those relief loans. Further ahead with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoeven. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and thanks for joining us once again here at Midweek. Well, let's talk agronomics for a change. It's time for you corn growers to be finalizing your pre-emergent weed control strategies if you're so inclined to employ that control approach. And we've been joined online now by Sarah Lancaster, a research and extension weed scientist here at Kansas State University, to go over the options and the management to think about here, Sarah. Pre-emergence herbicide treatments, though, have high value for the corn grower out there, don't they? They absolutely do, Eric. I totally understand the temptation or the justification for growers to try to go with a total post-emergent program in their their corn systems. But from a weed competition and from a herbicide resistance management standpoint, I just really encourage growers to, to think hard about incorporating particularly some soil applied products at the time of planting for corn and sorghum. You mentioned, though, that ever-present concern about herbicide resistance developing in weed populations out there. As one puts together their pre-emergent program or at-planting program, they need to keep that stewardship of product use well in mind, you say. Absolutely, Eric. You know, managing herbicide resistance needs to be something that growers keep in mind throughout the season. Uh, The best time to manage a herbicide resistant weed, particularly something like Palmer amaranth that gives so many people so many problems, is before that plant ever emerges. So if we can utilize things like atrazine or some of the acetamide products in our at planting or pre-emergent applications, we can really get ahead of Palmer amaranth. You know, the other advantage of using combinations of herbicides at planting is that some of the herbicides actually work better in combinations. So this is one of the reasons that so many of the products that can be used pre-emergent in corn come as premixes of other products. So, you know, atrazine has been a staple for weed management in corn for, for many, many years. And in addition to providing good weed control itself, it can enhance weed control by products like um, Callisto that contain mesotrione or activity of acetamide products like Dual or Outlook. So uh, lots of reasons to use multiple herbicides in your pre-emergent application. And Um, by following those guidelines, broad spectrum control of weeds can be achieved here, particularly with respect to broadleaf weeds, you say. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, different products are going to be stronger or provide more control of certain weeds. And so being aware of what your weed popu- what your target weed is, what your weed population is, um, is super important for picking the right herbicide. And not to overlook grassy weeds. We certainly want to keep them in the loop as far as our herbicide strategy. Exactly. You know, grassy weeds are very problematic in corn production. They 
can reduce yields when, when they're allowed to compete too long early in the season. They can um, utilize nitrogen maybe that was intended for your corn crop. So because grassy weeds are, you know, so similar to corn, they tend to be very competitive in those crops if they're not controlled. You mentioned the acetamids, the pyrazole products as well that can be used with atrazine effectively. We have the whole list of what we might term inhibitor products, too. Uh, bring those into the discussion here, if you would, Sarah, starting with the HPPD inhibitors, which also, you note in an article on this topic, can be effectively mixed with atrazine. Yes, exactly. So it's actually recommended to mix atrazine with those HPPD inhibiting herbicides to enhance control. Um, you might know them as the bleachers. So things like isoxaflutol or, or balance, things like mesotrione or callisto. Um, so those products can be effective pre or post. Some examples of products that can provide excellent weed control, but also have the potential for crop injury or the PPO inhibiting herbicides. So these are things like Valor or any of the other flumioxazin containing products, or also Sharpen is an example of this. We need to be careful and make sure that we're giving at least for Valor at least a week prior to planting our corn in order to avoid crop injury there. All of this is included, of course, on the label. You read that very carefully. Absolutely. So information on rotation restrictions and other details, uh, you know, always check the label or check the chemical weed control guide. Sarah, as many producers will attest, we've seen development of several ALS-resistant broadleaf weeds out there. So when thinking about that class of products, they need to... uh, consider that resistance potential, do they not? Absolutely. Um, It's so important to be aware of suspected herbicide resistance in your uh, weed populations. And, you know, ALS inhibiting herbicides were one of the first groups for which resistance was, you know, broadly identified. And so um, a lot of the the key weeds that these ALS inhibiting products are, are effective against things like cocklebur, sunflower, we have identified herbicide-resistant populations in the state of Kansas. So be sure and use them with other effective herbicide modes of action, which again is always the the recommendation for managing herbicide resistance. We're talking in some generalities here because there's such a long, long lineup of herbicide alternatives for pre-emergence control of weeds in corn. We're deferring folks, of course, to the Chemical Weed Control Guide for specifics on these alternatives as well as the product labels themselves. But we might note we are not close to grain sorghum planting, but we'll be there fairly soon. So a great number of these recommendations are mirrored for grain sorghum as well. Sarah? Absolutely, Eric. You know, grain sorghum does get planted later, but those herbicides that can be used pre-emergent in grain sorghum are basically a subset for the most part of the products that are used in corn. So again, you've got your triazines or atrazine as a, a foundational product. You've got your acetamide products like dimethinamide or Outlook and Dual as key components there. And then uh, mesotrione is an HPPD inhibitor and uh, Sharpen is a PPO inhibitor that can be used ahead of grain sorghum. So again, same ideas as far as mixing products and being aware of resistance issues, just fewer to choose from for grain sorghum. But again, you would endorse strongly the use of a pre-emergent in sorghum, much as you did earlier with corn. Absolutely. You know, pre-emergent herbicides are one of our key components for for preventing um, herbicide-resistant weeds later in the growing season. Well, by the way, we would advise growers to have a look as well at an article in the e-update series on pre-emergence herbicides for corn posted on April the 3rd. It's still there at agronomy.ksu.edu for review, covering in more detail a lot of what we addressed here today. Before we let you go, Sarah, we want to bring to growers' attention the opportunities for growers and other applicators to take online training certification for the use of two products, Dicamba and Paraquat. And uh, this is for those using largely specific seed technology out there. That's right. If growers plan to use um, extend varieties of soybean or cotton this summer, 
I just really want to encourage them to go ahead and get that training out of the way. Now, if they if they weren't able to attend any of the meetings that were held earlier this spring, at this point, the best option for guys to get that training is to um, just log in online to any of the, the company websites that, that have those products that contain dicamba that are labeled for over-the-top use in um, cotton or soybean. So those products would be Ingenia, Extendamax, Fexapan, and then also the new one this year, Tavium, um, which is the, the premix of Extendamax and, and Dual. So um, like I said, the best thing for that is to go to one of those companies, Bayer, BASF, Corteva, and just check out their online training. It's about 45 or 60 minutes. You have to take a little like five question quiz at the end. It's not, not an awful deal, but something that we need to do just to make sure we're being good stewards of the product and just to be good neighbors. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's one of the most important things about this is just being good neighbors to folks who are choosing to use different technology than we might choose. So again, for those dicamba applications, but we might bring up as well, paraquat containing products require additional certification. So same notation on that for growers? A little bit different. So for paraquat, um, we're looking not just for applicators, but handlers. The training for that is targeted at safe storage and handling and that actually is not offered through the company websites. The web, the link that you'll find in the um, e-update is actually, um, we'll send you to an e-extension webpage, and then you can do a short video and a little quiz from there. So again, uh, not terribly painful. It is, you know, some time, but that online link there is really the only way to get that Paraquat certificate for handlers. The certification links that she speaks of right there are all listed and handy for you to click on and access in the Agronomy e-update newsletter dated this past Friday, April the 10th, on the online training certification for dicamba and paraquat applications, again, at agronomy.ksu.edu in the e-update series. Well, Sarah, we're pushing even further into the growing season, so we'll have more weed control topics to bring up with your good help. Thank you very much, and we'll talk again then. Thanks, Eric. Looking forward to it. Weed Management Specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Sarah Lancaster, with us on this part of Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Keeping your distance from others is important in slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are some fun things to do alone. Read a book, take a walk, unpack your suitcase from that trip you took last September, paint a self-portrait, catch up on a TV series, do a puzzle. Remember, we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Agriculture Today returns now, and uh, questions abound over this new relief under what's called the CARES Act. That stands for Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which has been passed, put into effect. And one segment of that act generating interest in agricultural country, the Small Business Administration Program Payment Protection Loan. And we want to talk over some of the nuances of that as they're evolving, we might stress. Roger McGowan is with us once more. Roger is a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. Qualifying here a bit, Roger, there are things yet to be understood about this particular program, you say. Well, there are a lot of things that remain to be cleared up by Small Business Administration, not the least of which we'll get into a moment, concerns the eligibility of self-employed individuals, which is a big deal for many farmers who happen to be self-employed. But definitions are key. Uh, the statutory language is not clear on a number of points. And uh, we just, at this point in time, need the Small Business Administration to issue some clear guidance. They've done some. But the experience so far with lenders is that they appear to be all over the board and are making the loans under the program to certain individuals. Uh, same situated borrower could go to a different lender and get a different answer. Hmm. And so that is frustrating to practitioners that are trying to guide clients through this. So hopefully this will get better and soon, and we need guidance right away on a number of issues. Explain more about the premise of this and how it's to support qualified small businesses, as it's termed. 
Right. Well, the uh, Paycheck Protection Loan Program, or PPP as it's known, is just simply an extension of the existing Small Business Administration 7A loan program. And that's referring to the code section in the Small Business Administration Act. And it has many of the of the existing restrictions on those loans that are waived for a certain time frame, including guarantee and collateral requirements and the requirements that the borrower can't find credit elsewhere. So those those requirements are waived. And uh, you're also eligible for loan forgiveness, and that's that's a big issue for uh, businesses. This is the idea behind this is to get money into the hands of, of qualified businesses so that they can retain their employees uh, until the economy gets back up and rolling again. So it's a temporary program, infusion of capital. It's an upfront loan, all or some of which doesn't have to be uh, repaid but you have to be a qualified small business and that's a that's defined as a business in existence as of February 15 of this year that pays employees or independent contractors that doesn't have more than 500 employees and of course in ag that's going to rarely come into place now sole proprietorships and self-employed individuals uh, such as independent contractors may also qualify under the program and for a self-employed taxpayer, the loan amount is based on the taxpayer's net self-employment earnings, limited to $100,000 of self-employment income. So basically, the way they do the computations, the maximum loan is going to be about $21,000 because it's set at 20.833% of self-employment earnings plus other payroll costs. Well, if you don't have any other payroll costs, you're just a sole proprietorship, the maximum loan you're going to get under the PPP is $20,833.33. Now, what we don't know in that situation is whether that's the correct computation percentage. We also don't know whether you can actually include independent contractors in your calculation for purposes of the loan. Is that double dipping? In other words, if I'm running a farming operation and I'm self-employed, but I hire maybe a, a custom cutter to come in and cut for me, cut wheat this summer, and uh, I pay them, they're an independent contractor, or I hire someone to, to uh, crop dust crops, I hire them as an independent contractor, can I count them as payroll costs, or is that deemed to be double dipping? Uh, because those contractors will apply for their own loan. We don't know the answer to that yet. That's an interesting question. Plus, what if I have, uh, say, seasonal workers that are H-2A persons? Mm -hmm. it, the law is very specific that any compensation of an employee whose principal place of residence is outside the U.S. is excluded from payroll costs. So I think uh, H-2A compensation would not apply, but there's nothing in the guidance telling you not to count them in your employee count. So we've got a whole host of issues like that, Eric, that still are unresolved, and we need resolution of those immediately. One of the main cogs of this, Roger, relating to agriculture is how self-employment will be interpreted under eligibility for these SBA loans. Yeah, and we just recently got guidance from the Small Business Administration concerning self-employed persons. Uh, however, for the typical self-employed farmer, the guidance remains based on net farm income. The guidance, unfortunately, continues to refer to Schedule C taxpayers, not Schedule F. The problem I have with this is farmers tend to have a lot more equipment gains that are reported on Form 4797 that, that is not reported on Schedule F. And that's a result of the change in the rules with respect to 1031 uh, trades under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was enacted in late 17, effective starting in 18. We can't trade under the 1031 like kind exchange rules personal property anymore. Farmers will still trade combines and tractors, but we treat it differently on the return. None of that flows through the Schedule F, and it wipes out self-employment tax by going to the 4797. So my fear is on that, since they've forgotten to address that, initially as farmers apply for these loans, self-employed farmers, they may be showing actually a loss on the Schedule F and not have net income, and they then be bounced out, but yet they have a significant amount of gain as a result of trades that is showing on a 4797. So it's not it's really not fair uh, for a farmer that does have income. It's just on the wrong form. The SBA has given us no guidance with respect to that. So here's how I would break it down. Uh, what they say is if you're self-employed as a Schedule C taxpayer, non-farm, uh, you had to be in operation as of February 15 of this year. You're self-employed. Your residence has to be in the United States, and you file or will file a 1040 Schedule C for 19. 
Uh, you don't have to file one yet. That doesn't come up until July 15 this year. But again, those references are to Schedule C. You should be able to substitute Schedule F for Schedule C in that guidance, but we don't know that yet. Other things we don't know uh, concerning partnerships, for example, they're eligible for a, a PPP loan, and that requires the partnership to include self-employment income of all the partners as part of the overall payroll cost for the partnership. Now, the guidance precludes each partner from getting a loan, but the guidance is silent on partners that are in multiple partnerships. So if we have a farmer that is a partner in five partnerships and earns at least 100000 or net SE earnings in each partnership, we don't know whether they're eligible or not. I would think so, but they didn't talk about that. The guidance is silent as to whether each partner can use the full 100000 compensation limit or whether it has to be allocated among each partnership. Uh, so those are just things that remain unknown at this point in time. Uh, I think some farmers are going to be thinking about filing an amended tax return to increase their net income for 2019 on Schedule F. That's allowed, but the question is whether it's worth the cost, uh, because to get any additional loan proceeds, you're going to have to spend 15.3% on self-employment tax plus federal and state income tax. At a minimum, that's likely going to be at least another 10%, getting your tax total up to about 25%. So assuming you're zero and you get a maximum $20,833 loan, you're going to spend about $25,000 in taxes. That doesn't sound like a good deal to me. So those are some of the issues we really need to still have clarified. SBA basically just simply forgot about agriculture in this most recent guidance. With the guidance being silent on so many key points here, if the SBA doesn't return and address these specifics directly, does that leave a great lot of latitude with lenders, for instance, as far as declaring a, an individual producer eligible for these loans? Uh, it may actually work the opposite way. I don't know. I, if you think of it from a lender standpoint, they may take the opposite position and say you're not eligible mm -hmm. because we don't have clear guidance on this. Now, I understand the point that you make, and I think that's well taken. They could take that position. Uh, well, you're not disqualified, but I think it may be more likely that they take the position in that uh, we don't know that you are qualified. Mm -hmm. So I hope there'll be additional guidance from the SBA for farmers, especially concerning whether equipment gains count or don't count. If they don't count, I think most farmers will simply obtain a loan based on their employees' payroll costs, but you have to have employees to have a payroll cost. Right. Since uh, farmers had very little Schedule F net profits in 2019, in fact, total Schedule F losses over the last decade have averaged over $5 billion annually. So this equipment gain issue is really, as I see it, the key issue that SBA has to address. Can we count the gains that are now reported on a 4797, even though there's no self-employment tax, toward this $100,000 limit that applies for self-employed individuals in order to participate in the PPP and get a loan based on that? There are a ton of intricacies involved in this. So obviously, a producer out there interested in the possibility of obtaining one of these loans needs to talk with their lender. You are keeping on top of the latest regarding all of the aspects of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act, including what's developing on the Paycheck Protection Loans on your blog at washburnlaw.edu slash WALTR. Roger, as always, thanks for the insight on this, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you, Eric. Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law. He's along with us every other Wednesday on Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Broadcasting from the campus since 1924, this is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Now over to today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Farm state senators continue to fire off letters to the USDA, outlining their preferences for specific commodities in any USDA COVID-19 aid plan. Senate Agriculture Committee Ranking Member Debbie Stabenow and other lawmakers have sent a series of letters, in fact, to USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue, calling for USDA COVID-19 aid to include specialty crop producers, which the letter said have seen losses of $5 billion so far, with more ahead. They want the USDA to provide direct payments to cover lost revenue and increased production costs, and want the agency to buy specialty crops to redistribute distribute to food banks, to schools, and to emergency feeding organizations. Now, for dairy, another letter calls on the USDA to build off existing programs to deliver both direct assistance to dairy farmers and intervene in the market to reverse the decline in futures prices and signal a floor on farm prices, as the letter reads. They also want the USDA to reopen the dairy market coverage sign-up that closed in December and make sizable buys of dairy products for food and feed efforts. A portion of the $9.5 billion tabbed for COVID-19 aid from USDA also needs to go to local farmers who sell directly to consumers, schools, institutions, and others, according to a third letter. Lawmakers signing that letter noted the specific mention of those who supply local food systems as being eligible for a portion of the aid. They called on the USDA to require those receiving the aid show that they have at least 25 percent of their total farm income from local sales. The USDA is expected to unveil its details of around $16 billion in aid plans either this week or next week. Meantime, an updated economic analysis looking at the impact of COVID-19 projects that crop producers will see an $11.85 billion in lower revenue in 2020, and all livestock sectors combined to seeing a $20.24 billion drop in receipts for the year. The Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri updated its numbers for crop and livestock prices due to the impacts of COVID-19. This analysis shows price declines and lower demand for every sector of agriculture. The early partial analysis from FAPRI shows a potential overall $32 billion drop in cash receipts for crops and livestock. That leads to a net farm income for 2020 dropping by $20 billion once lower input prices and higher government payments are included in that analysis. Looking at the 2021 crops, FAPRI is projecting a 5 to 10 percent drop drop in grain and oilseed prices. The Institute also sees an 8 to 12 percent drop in livestock prices this year. FAPRI notes the key unknown is now whether the coronavirus creates a V-shaped recession with quick market recovery or an economic disruption that lasts longer and carries into 2021. The USDA's next major supply and demand analysis, along with its price forecast for 2021 crops, will come, by the way, with the May 12th monthly WASD report. And U.S. hog producers are now expected to lose $37 per head the rest of the year due to the coronavirus-19 situation, which will be losses of about $5 billion for the hog industry. That's according to the National Pork Producers Council. As hog plants have suspended operations due to workers contracting COVID-19, NPPC President Howard Roth says that conditions have become, quoting here, dramatically worse in recent days. That situation has meant that hogs are backing up on farms. He added that market-ready hogs have nowhere to go. While pork supplies are currently adequate, the group warns that if hog plants shutdowns grow, it will impact retail supplies to consumers. The group also wants the USDA to buy up to $1 billion in pork for domestic food and feeding programs. They're urging that the products should also include those packaged for restaurants and other areas of the food service sector. A pathogen known as Fusarium head blight, and you've heard about it here in wheat country, threatens wheat crops globally. A relative to wheat may have a genetic answer to help increase disease resistance. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. 
It's among the threats to global wheat crops, including those in the U.S., a fungal bacterium called Fusarium head blight. So that has both effects that reduce the yield and also affect the people and animal health. USDA researcher Jiwa Bai says the disease not only impacts wheat quality and yield, FHB produces mycotoxins within the grain, which can lead to vomiting in humans and weight loss in livestock. Now it appears Bai and a group of USDA researchers in conjunction with Chinese university scientists have found a way to combat fusarium head blight via genetics. We found another gene that's from wheat grass. A specific gene of interest from this wheat relative, called FHB7, was cloned, and results discovered in the lab indicate... Not only reduce the disease level, but also detoxify that vomit toxin. FHB-resistant wheat varieties are still years away from becoming available to producers. A broadband reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. By the way, GWA's work for the USDA is conducted right here at Kansas State University. And John Deere has fired up a new enterprise that will protect health care workers in collaboration with the United Auto Workers, the Iowa Department of Homeland Security, and the Illinois Manufacturers Association. John Deere announced that it is producing protective face shields for health care workers. That work began a week ago today. The face shields are being produced at the John Deere Seeding Group in Moline, Illinois. That facility manufactures planting equipment and precision agricultural technology. Deere employees will initially produce 25,000 face shields to meet the immediate needs of health care workers in several of its manufacturing communities. Materials and supplies are on order to produce an additional 200,000 face shields. The company is using an open source design from the University of Wisconsin Medicine for its project. That's a look at today's lead stories from the Agricultural News page. Take this opportunity before the break to remind you once again if you'd like to listen to this broadcast on demand at your leisure, it's as simple as subscribing to our podcast service. You can do so by going to agtoday.net, agtoday.net. You can listen to a replay of any of the broadcasts right there, or you can subscribe to the podcast service and have it downloaded to your mobile device. That is at agtoday.net, and this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. I will always remember Bud, the old farmer who grew wheat, beans, on our farm. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. I heard her say, you are no farmer. It's true. We do own land which is being farmed, but I am not farming it. A friend's cattle run on the grass in summer. He also cuts the hay he wants and needs. My friend is a rancher and farmer. I used to do fencing, clearing, and look after the land. But with the bum knee and bum shoulder, it's tough. Each time I do something, I notice it. Just the other day, I pulled a heavy, broken, and fallen branch out of the woods. I will cut it up. When I, after pulling and pulling, got it clear, I was reminded that my shoulder was hurting. Of course, I would have pulled it out with truck or tractor, but there is no tractor here. Like my wife said while we were enjoying a cup of tea, you are no farmer. We have no equipment. I was not disagreeing. However, I could have said, what about when I ran Ainsley Farm in Australia? The family joke is how was it possible that we ever started on having a family? when I would fall asleep on the floor coming back inside. But that is a long time ago, and we do have five fantastic grown children with their own children and their own grandchildren. And that should tell you I'm old. 
and getting older, which in itself is not a bad thing. It's a gift if one can keep moving and doing. And it is the doing I was grumbling about. And it was my grumbling which made my wife say, you are not a farmer. Maybe I should have added any more. The realization of aging made me think of an ode to old farmers. Old farmers. I've seen them. I've watched them when I was still working and because of my work visited retirement homes. Some looked like locked up bears. Others like tamed bears. I think to be an old farmer is not easy. It can be emotionally very hard, especially when you still have your mind that can see what needs to be done. You know your farm, your cattle, your horses, your equipment, as no one else knows, or so you think. You walk the farm with your children and your grandchildren. You explored. You made history on your land. As you farmed, you made changes and bought newer machinery when you could afford it. Maybe you bought even when you could not afford it. Maybe you may do with the old because you knew how the old kept running. You knew. But as we get older, there is that moment, or rather time, when you start to slow down and must rest more often. If you don't, you pay a price. It used to be that three generations would live and work on a farm or ranch, and that would take care of a smooth running operation, sometimes not easy. The challenge is that we are talking of a farm or ranch of diverse piece of land, which is alive. At least that's how I see our land, a 400-plus acre farm. The old farmer can't let go as long as as he keeps his mind. Years ago, I was told this story of an old rancher who had his ranch horses. A mare had foaled, and he was told about it. On a quiet evening, he walked out. He made it to the corral, where the foal had been born. He went out to the foal and hugged it. When they went to look for him, they found him dead with his arms locked around the foal. That is the way to go. That is also the problem. That is why I believe old farmers and ranchers can have it very tough emotionally when their bodies do not allow them to do the things they could do so easily when young. I've known a farmer with two replaced knees. One time, sitting down on the ground, I had to help him up. He was a big man. He used to jump out of the tractor onto the ground. Doing that for a long time ruined his knees. He was still farming, growing wheat, Kansas wheat. As I said, to me a farmer in a retirement home is like a locked-up bear. And I've made recommendations to grow a small plot of wheat on the retirement home's ground especially for a retirement home in western Kansas, rural Kansas. You don't need a big tractor to grow a small plot of wheat. I will always remember Bud, the old farmer, who grew wheat, beans, and more wheat on our farm. Together we looked at the sprouting wheat in the fall after the land was prepared. The earth smelled and looked dark when freshly planted. We would look together. Then as the wheat grew, we worried together. But he never showed it. As the wheat ripened, he would take a wheat head. And so would I. And we rolled it in the palm of our hand. We would blow the chaff away, chew on the kernels. Not yet, but would say. But soon, then the combine would come with the old trucks. Then the joy of harvest. Old Bud, the same man who would stop the machinery to shoo away a small curvy of Bob Whites and the fawn 
bedded down and hiding in the wheat. Old farmers. Anneke is right. I'm not a farmer anymore. But I love the land. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Featured every Wednesday right here. And that rounds out today's edition. As always, thanks to you for tuning in. And please rejoin us here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.